It's a delight to have in the studio today Father Patrick Reardon. For our viewers who don't know Father Pat, let me just tell you a little bit about him. He has an amazing history, personal history biography. He is a senior priest of All Saints Orthodox Church in Chicago. This is a parish of the Antiochian Archdiocese here in America. He is a devoted father and husband and grandfather. He is a man of vast educational pedigree. He has studied at some of the most elite educational institutions both in America and in Europe. He's known for his uh, tremendous biblical scholarship and has published many articles and many books on many different subjects. And he is a senior editor at Touchstone Magazine. And we could go on. But we're delighted to have him uh, in studio to speak with us today about the Psalter and the salvation of Christians. Father Pat, thank you for coming into the studio. My pleasure. Father, could you begin by giving us an orientation to the importance of the Psalter in the Christian life? How important is the Psalter to a Christian? The manuscript traditions indicate that very clearly. You see, th back when the, the, the owning of a Bible was an important financial investment. Mm -hmm. Ordinary parish churches did not have Bibles. And when they had them, they were chained there at the lectionary so they could not be stolen because they were the most valuable thing you would have. Mm -hmm. We only have a few full manuscripts of the, of the whole Bible from the fourth century. And this is after the time of, uh, after, the, after the Edict of Milan and the freedom of the church. Your ordinary parish church did not have a Bible. Sure. It had a New Testament and a book of Psalms. And the custom came of actually binding the, New Te the, the Psalms with the New Testament, mm. because this was the essentials. Other lectionaries, you would have chosen readings if the, parish, if the church could afford it. Remember, the vast majority of churches did not have copies of the whole Bible for sure. many first centuries, because it was such an enormous financial investment. So you've got this custom, we think of it as Protestant, of binding the New Testament with the Psalter. So the Psalter becomes virtually a book of the New Testament. That's mm -hmm. a very, very ancient tradition represented in the manuscripts. So your little pocket New Testament with the Psalter in the back, it's got everything you need <laughs> for a full life, a full life of prayer. Uh, that should tell you something about the importance of the Psalms. But it was obvious to you that you could not have a Christian life without the prayer book of the church. Mm. The prayer book of the church was the prayer book of Israel. Mm. And notice, notice that the church still, still follows the, that, that custom of reciting through the entire book of Psalms every week. That was not, that was not a, a custom of uh, just monasticism. That was a custom that came from, from Israel itself. That's a rabbinic custom. How was that done? You, you're saying that the Psalter is appointed to be read each week in the church in the divine services. Can you tell us more about the role of the Psalter in the actual church services themselves? It varies from east to west, mm -hmm. but usually your whole prayer thing is built around the Psalms. You know, so that you would you pray your Psalms for, for a little while, then you would stop, have it be called a stasis, introduce a short litany, mm -hmm. just so it doesn't become monotonous. Okay? But the uh, the Psalms are the, bulk of the bulk of the worship. And we, the way we do the divine liturgy now, we kept the litanies at the beginning of the divine liturgy. We've dropped the whole stasis mm. of psalms mm. that come between the litanies. Why do we do that? To shorten the services so people can get home to watch the tennis match. Yes. Oof. Oof. <laughs> but we're losing the psalms, the precious losing, psalms, losing, in the, losing psalms in the, in the midst in of In fact, there was, a, there, was, there was a very strong, we got a letter from years ago, not, not under the current administration, but years ago, we got letters from them, don't use those, don't take, start doing psalms during the Divine Liturgy. It lengthens sure. the service too much. Sure. And if myself, there's no such thing as too long a service. Sure. <laughs> uh, I would do that. On the other hand, for some other people, because I'm responsible for a congregation, for some of them, there is too such a thing as too long a service. Mm -hmm. And I have to keep, keep that in mind as well. But on the other hand, I don't want to introduce psalms and then you're rush through them. And that's a tendency I see with it, sometimes investors. Psalm 103 is rushed through sure. instead of being relished. Mm -hmm. And the hexapsalm, most where you six, six highly concentrated psalms. 
yes. rich theology. At the beginning of Orthros. So, so it started to cram together mm. at the beginning of Orthros. Yeah. Am I right, though, to say that, that the Psalter remains, even in the liturgy, though we take out those early typical psalms, still in the Orthros and in the Vesper service, still the majority of the material of the text is actually directly from the Psalter. Right, yes. And if I have my choice, and I always do have my choice because I'm a busy, busy parish priest, of what parts of the service I'm going to do for the hours, sure. I don't omit, omit psalms. Sure. I might omit some of the other things, but I don't omit the psalms. How is it that Christians appropriated the prayer book of Israel? How do we as Christians pray the Psalter in a distinction from how a Jew might? You get an indication of that already in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Notice the dominance of the Psalms, if, if, if for example, in, in, in Peter's first sermon, he begins with, the, he begins with a, a, text, a, a text from uh, from Jewel about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. immediately goes to the Psalms. Psalm 15, Psalm 109. Um, notice how the, the, the reference to the Psalm, how, notice how the Psalms are used, in, the second Psalm is used in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. When the, when, when the church is praying, the Lord who made heaven and earth and all that is in them, who said by the mouth of the prophet David, and then they quote the second psalm. Mm -hmm. you know? the, the, a Jew has never, the Jew doesn't believe the Messiah has come yet. Sure. But the, the anointed one in Psalm 2, they know, they, they know exactly who that is, because God has made both Lord and anointed one, Mashiach, this Jesus whom you crucified. The Christ is the, is, is the, is the, is the center of the Psalter. You have a book I remember reading it some years ago about the Psalter in relationship to Jesus Christ our Savior. And if I if I remember right, almost every psalm, if not every psalm, you find a way to have a Christological interpretation. Yes, Can absolutely. you explain that? How is that? How is that possible? In the Psalms, the Holy Spirit gives us the words to say to God. Okay? But the, the God we're praying to is the God of Jesus Christ. We pray the Psalms and we read the scriptures through the noose, the mind of Jesus Christ. Mm. It's interesting how St. Um, Saint Jerome translates it in Latin, sensus, not intellectus, sensus. Mm. It'd be something we would call the Greek phonema. Through this, we read it through Christ's reading of the Psalms. It's often you have the voice of Christ in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Psalm 21 is a very clear example a from the cross. Sure. Uh, he, uh, he, he prays a line of Psalm 30, according to the Gospel of Luke. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. For thou hast redeemed me, Lord God of truth. And the line goes on. Sure. Uh, there are one mediator between God and man. We don't go to God except through Jesus, okay. who shares his nature and ours, who shares his experience and ours. Okay. We pray through his prayer. So that all the Psalter is filtered through Christ. If all of the Psalms have a, a Christological meaning, what is the nature of Psalms that are called by scholars Messianic Psalms? That's a that's a, a it's an artificial thing. Mm -hmm. What they mean is lines in the Psalms that are specifically said to be prophetic in the New Testament. Okay. That's not an adequate that's not an adequate the New Testament you don't have Psalm 1 quoted, for example, in the New Testament as being Messianic. But the church has always read Psalm 1, the blessings of the man, the Asherah Ha'ish, okay? the blessings of the man. All the fathers of the church, except the heretics like Theodore of Mopsuestia, mm -hmm. they see that as a reference to Christ. Uh -huh. it's, uh, uh, the, uh, the man in Psalm 1 has to be the same as the man in Psalm 8. What is the man, Mahenosh, what is the man that always visited him? There's an exegesis of that psalm okay, in the second chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews. Uh -huh. you know, that we've seen, we've seen Jesus made a little lower than the angels in order to suffer death, crowned with glory and honor. It's all quotations from that psalm. Now that would be a messianic psalm, Paul, but the but the, the your tradition doesn't refer to messianic psalms. The whole psalter is messianic. Indeed, could we say the entire Old Testament is Messianic? I think we better say that. Yes. Because remember, the last thing Jesus does before, in the Gospel of Luke, the last thing Jesus does before he sends the apostles out to preach the Gospel of the nations, he opens their minds that they might understand the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. And he opens their minds to 
the Torah, the Nevi'im, the, the prophets, and the Psalter, mm. and the Psalms. And that scene follows right on the story of the two disciples in the Metro Mass. He opens their minds to understand the scriptures. He walks with them. He walks through the three parts of scripture. Mm. The, the, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Beautiful. Listening to you for many years, as I have through your podcast on Ancient Faith, Faith Radio, homilies from all saints, I have heard, and I've heard recently with you being here uh, in California with us, I hear a nonstop stream of memorized psalms coming from your mouth, from your heart, from your mind. Will you speak a little bit about the importance of memorizing psalms? It's obvious that you do that. Why do you do that? How do you do that? And what would you recommend to the faithful who are trying to internalize the psalms? I have never, never memorized a psalm. I have never done that. I have never memorized a psalm. <laughs> Intentionally, you mean? I mean, I'm just sitting down and memorize. No, I wouldn't do that. I'd keep praying the psalm sure. until I know it by heart. Uh, and sometimes the best way of, of fixing that is through music. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the psalms I sing according to the eight tones of the church. Not all of them. Some of the psalms I, I, I pray very early in the morning while my wife is still sleeping. And I don't want to sing them because it will wake her up. Sure. You know? um, <laughs> I wouldn't want that. So I sit very quietly in the dark and I, I start reciting the, reciting the psalms. I, some years ago they, they made me get a, is an MRI. They put you through this tube oh, sure, and take right. pictures, you know. I thought, I have terrible claustrophobia. I will never survive that. I will have a nervous breakdown while oh. I'm in there. Okay? I thought, well, what can I control? I can control my eyelids. I'll just keep them closed. You know? Now, what will I do to control my mind? I'll recite the Psalms. Beautiful. So I lay back, and I started Psalm 1. By the time we got to Psalm 19, the process was over. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> That's how I survived. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Our Savior did that, didn't he? Well, I'm, I'm quite Even sure. on the cross. I'm, I'm quite sure. Even on the In cross. In fact, the, the old tradition is that he saw, started with Psalm 21, My God, My God, away has forsaken me, and simply read through all the Psalms until he got to Psalm 30, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. Mm. That he did those, he, they did those 11 Psalms, or, or 12 Psalms, whatever it is. While suspended, while suspended on the, the Holy Cross. cross. While he was la raising his hands mm -hmm. to God as the, as the evening sacrifice. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. There are some psalms that are hard to understand their intention. And sometimes in the Christian sense, almost hard to uh, reconcile with our disposition. I'm thinking particularly of those psalms that are sometimes called imprecatory psalms or war psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how should a Christian, how does the Orthodox Church understand the relevance of those psalms? How did Jesus understand them? That's what I'm asking you. Yeah, well, that, that, that's because I think we have an indication of that. Oh, really? Sure. Jesus, Jesus cites uh, Psalm 108, for example, with regard to his betrayal. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, it, it, it figures into the, to, because Jesus has enemies. Sure. Jesus has enemies. And the, 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 the Psalter is for those who are at war. Now, who are the enemies of Christ? Well, we're thinking particularly of demonic forces. Mm -hmm. And we pray against those demonic forces. I think we don't, we don't really tend nowadays to take the demons. We think the, we think the devil is some guy in red, in red leotards with, with horns. I mean, these, sure. are, these are malignant spirits. Mm. Our, our, our fight, as we had in the epistle this morning from Ephesians, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the spirits in high places. You know? Now, sometimes the expression of that is a little rough. You know? A little rough? A I'm little thinking rough. of uh, one cathisma in Vespers that we often hear, I think it's on Tuesday evening or Thursday evening. May his wife be a widow, may his children yes, never so see him. Psalm 108. <laughs> yes. Psalm 108. I thought you were going to say uh, so the, the, the Psalm of Two Cities. Um, uh, where he's, he's, he's in Babylon, by the rivers of Babylon. I, I, we saw, while we remembered Zion, it goes back and forth. You know. sure. And how's that end? With the, with the grabbing the, the little babies. Of the and da the dashing the infants against the rock. Dashing the against the rock. That's a little rough if you start understanding it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but remember that Jesus prays this psalm. 
Yes. You know? He's the same one who blessed little children. So obviously, he's not asking for little babies to be bashed out. You know? sure. I think a good way of going about that is the way that's treated in the Rule of St. Benedict. How's that? The Rule of St. Benedict says the monk must keep control over his thoughts, constant discipline over his thoughts. He says, and any thought that rears its head against Christ, that thought must be bashed out on the rock, which Ooh. is Christ. He's, he's citing that psalm. Beautiful. I mean, no, just cut, it, cut it off. He's not thinking about little Babylonian babies who can't help sure. it. Sure. <laughs> sure. And <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting that the, the world would object to that psalm, the same world that kills little babies, uh, wholesale. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Lord have mercy. I heard you uh, recently making a thematic connection between the opening psalms of the Psalter 1, 2, and 3. And I'm wondering if you could explain in more detail that movement. Sure. I see Christology in all three of those psalms. First is the blessed man, the Adam. Okay? He, he, not just Adam, but he, because the word here used in the, in the Greek is anir, and the word used in the, in the, he, in the Hebrew is ish, and the word used in the Latin is weir. All those refer to the male. Mm. He's, he's the just man, and there's the contrast between the just and the rashayim, who are the, the evil, the contrast between good and evil. Okay? Sure. So there's, there's there Christ as the man, the blessed man, the one that uh, Augustine calls the, the Dominicus homo, the, the man who is lordly. Mm. In Psalm 2, there's animosity. The evil, the counsel of the evil, is in the in, in the Psalm one talks about the counsel of the evil. Sure. What is the counsel of the evil? Go to Psalm two. Why do the nations rage and the people utter vain things against the Lord, and against His anointed? Who is the anointed one? So the man of Psalm one now becomes the anointed one of Psalm two, mm -hmm. the one who, to whom God says, "Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee." That's in Psalm two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about the importance of that psalm in the New Testament. Oh, sure. So you've moved now from simply, from simply contrast, good and evil. It, now it's evil against good. Okay. So your second one is, is the man, then there's Messiah. Psalm three. Lord, why are there are so many people making life rough for me? Many are saying of me, there is no help for him as God. It goes on and pray and pray. It's, it's the persecuted just man. So you've moved from the man to the Messiah to the suffering servant. Oh, beautiful. There's a whole Christology there within the first three Psalms. Mm. Oh. And uh, I like to pray them together. I always do Psalm 3 at the beginning just out of fidelity to the fact that the church has always begun the morning prayer, east and west. With the third Psalm? St. Rule of St. Benedict. Why is that? I think. I think because the lines in it, I laid me down to sleep and I rose before the, because the Lord uh -huh. has sustained me. I think that's sure. why that's, I think that's why the, so I begin with Psalm 3 in the morning. Um, Prepares you for the troubles that are coming. Actually, I don't begin with Psalm 3. When I get up in the morning, I have two sets of stairs I have to come downstairs. As I'm coming down the first set of stairs, very quietly because I don't want to wake my wife, I'm praying Psalm, uh, Psalm 99. The Yubilati of the Omis Terra. Uh, make joy to the Lord with all you. It's a very short psalm, okay? But it's an invitatory psalm calling the nations to worship God. Nice. By the time I get to the landing, I finish that psalm. Now I'm starting down the next set of stairs, and I do Psalm 66. Day is misery after no street of Benedicta Novus. God have mercy upon us and save us. Let the light of his countenance shine upon us mm. and have mercy upon us. I get to the bottom of the stairs, I finish that psalm. That's when I, then I turn off the, the, uh, the alarm on the door. I go back to fix the coffee. <laughs> Okay. Do you have a coffee psalm? I do. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> of course you do. You know, Father, I've noticed uh, in my own little uh, researches over the years uh, that many fathers were absolutely uh, of the same disposition that you have, just absolutely loved the Psalter, wrote commentaries on the Psalter. I'm thinking of as recently as uh, Elder Paisio, St. Paisios the New, mm -hmm. who wrote, wrote a whole collection of uh, counsel for what salt psalm is good for healing what passion oh, and what absolutely. discouragement. St. Athanasius the Great Athanasius did it. Athanasius wrote that letter to Marcellus. Yes. I read that when I was 18. It did blew you really? me away. Yes, it blew me away. It sounds like for, for the pastors, there is a particular relevance for the psalms, besides their spiritual life and besides their corporate worship, that 
we who are pastoring and are trying to provide spiritual therapy for people against passions, that the Psalter has a particular relevance for curing particular diseases. Yes, yes, yes. yes. There are certain psalms, certain psalms you pray against certain passions. Yes, that's very, very uh, St. Paisius is not making that up. That's an yeah. old, old tradition. Old tradition. Many of our uh, English speakers, English Orthodox Christians, are, well, we're suffering, really. We're suffering from having to use Bible translations that aren't authorized by the church, haven't been written, uh, or translated, rather, by the church. Uh, and this affects us in every area, our gospel texts, our epistle books, um, and the Psalter itself. And I'm wondering if you could make some helpful suggestions to Orthodox Christians in the United States and in England, English-speaking world, about what translations are the best for the Psalter? The only translation that I'm, I'm really prepared to recommend in English is the Psalms, the Psalter according, according to the 70, mm -hmm. published at the Transfiguration Monastery in, in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. That's directly that's coming that's direct translation from the canonical text, uh -huh. from, the, from the Greek text. How different is that canonical text from what a person might find in a in the New English Bible or the New International Version or something that is more commonly found uh, in America? Every single copy of the New International Version should be burned. Okay. It's heretical Agreed. from the very start. Yes. From the very from Genesis one one, it's heretical. Mm. In Genesis one one, it, it changes the theology of creation. Mm. In the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, the whole earth was tohu ba bohu. That's not the text says. Oh. Okay. As though God imposes order on chaos. God calls things from nothingness. Oh. That 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 translation of the Bible is. Okay. <laughs> I uh. <laughs> okay. okay. I formally would, cast it out. I would, frankly, I would I would avoid almost any translation that was made during the 20th century. Really. I don't like the English Bible. I mean, they although that's better than some of them. You know these these Rolling Stone Bibles that mm -hmm. you, you get from. Even the NIV, the New International Version. Okay, the, that's the old one. That's that one. Is, it, it's not heretical. That one, however, is, is entirely the cool. NIV. We were talking about the NIV. You must. Be, what are you referring to? I guess I was referring to, to the new. The RSV. Do you mean the new RSV? Yeah, that's the what new was. RSV. The, the NRSV. NIV, okay, yes, the RSV. Just the old NIV. My problem with it is that it's 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 uh, it's Protestant. Yeah. It presupposes Protestant institutions. Sure. So you don't have ordination, you have appointments. Okay. You don't have heaven, you have sky. Yes. Okay. Everything seems to be desacralized. Mm. Well, yeah, I didn't mean to uh, you'd call the NIV. You know, that would be. So we should use uh, an English translation of the canonical text of the church. Mm -hmm. And the best one you're suggesting is the Psalter of the Seventy, published yes. by Holy Transfiguration yes. Monastery. If I were regular, in, in fact, I have. I have folks in our parish who pray that psalm. That's the one we use in our parish. That's we use that in our services. Nice. Use that one. Yes, we do we, as well. We do we do not we do not use the psalter that came through the um, mm -hmm. through the prayer book. Of the it simply isn't, isn't that good. And it's, it, it's usually based on some Protestant rendering. Yes, I, and I'm not really against translations of the Bible that are made directly from Hebrew. I'm not. I'm not. I don't, I mean, I think it's, it's a calumny we accuse the Jews of falsifying the text. That's simply not true. The Jews did not falsify their text. It's just a different tradition of text. That's sure. all, you know. Sure. Uh, and, I, and I love the Hebrew Psalter. Yes, uh, you, quote, it's, you it's, quote it constantly. I'm, I'm not, it's not the one I use for my own prayer, but it's, it's, but I'd like to read the Psalms. And the when Jesus quoted the Psalter uh, throughout his life, am I right to think that he was quoting the Psalter from the Greek text? Oh, I don't think so. Really? No, no, I don't think so. I think he was using a Targumic text uh -huh. uh, in Aramaic. Mm -hmm. Jesus probably did speak Greek because mm -hmm. he's from Galilee. Sure. So he probably did speak Greek, but I'm, I'm sure he's using he's using a, a, the, uh, a Targumic text uh -huh. in, in Aramaic. Um, and you'll notice sometimes the quotations in, uh, uh, from the Old Testament and the New Testament don't correspond to any known yes, manuscripts right. at all. Yes, right. Well, just it's not there, clearly there were from a lot either. more versions in those days, uh -huh. and some of them disappeared. Right. If it's really, it's really. I say, it's very much of a calumny that the that the Christians burned the synagogues and all the manuscripts in the synagogue. We burned them for centuries, and then we blamed the Jews because they don't have ancient texts. Hmm. Oof. Oof. <laughs> I mean, we got have a lot to answer for with respect to how we treated the Jews. 
Que beleza. Uhum. Father, what concluding word might you offer to someone who's been been inspired to uh, approach the Psalter and they've listened to you and they're just on the cusp of beginning to read it in a serious way and to pray through it? What what good word would you give them? Small portions. Pray the psalm. Um, pray, pray psalms. Not don't try to do the whole Psalter. In in this busy year uh, 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 age we live, which we live. To do the whole Psalter, you have to know vast amounts of it by heart. Sure. You just, just do it. I could not possibly pray through the whole book of Psalms unless I could sing Psalms while I'm showering, sure. sing Psalms while I'm driving, well, recite Psalms while I'm doing things. You know. uh, I've, I've gradually sort of melded it into my, into my life. Sure. But begin small, begin small. Begin small and sing some of them if you can. If you can. I, I urge people in, in confession, Psalm 3 in the morning, Psalm 4 at night. It's easy to, re easy to remember. Sure, easy to remember. Psalm 3, is, church has always begun matins with Psalm 3. Psalm 4 is, an, is a nighttime song. Okay. The rule of St. Benedict is the first psalm for Compline. Mm -hmm. okay. It's 3 and 4. And never get that down. If you got down 3, then we'll introduce 5 into there, because Psalm, psalm 5 is also a morning psalm. Nice. Well, uh, we have our choirs here have some beautiful settings of the psalms that have been arranged by His Grace Bishop Basil from Wichita that our choirs, both our youth choir and our adult choir, sing. And I've, I've heard my own children singing them outside of the liturgy because it's really been, been impressed deeply upon them. And another psalm that our people, I think, very commonly say throughout the Orthodox world, because it's often found in prayer books and morning prayers, the 50th psalm. Oh yes. What should the, what the, should the, be the, in the, our minds when we are reading the fiftieth psalm? There's a whole bunch of things that you could you could take so many approaches to Psalm fifty. The one that grabs me is the, the, the parts of it we particularly like have to do with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You notice that's a psalm that's psalm used in the Byzantine uh, Typicon. That's used at the third hour, the descent of the Holy Spirit. Create a clean heart in me, O God. Renew the right spirit within me. With the take not thy Holy Spirit from me, take, and, and restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Mm. Uh, in in before before I begin the divine liturgy on Sundays, I pray. Uh, after I finish the, the prayers that they're prescribed, I begin because the choir is still singing. O God. Uh, with this hour to send thy Holy Spirit upon the initial apostles, the third hour. Take him not from us, O good one, but renew him and I should pray to thee. Mm. Create a clean heart in me, O God, renew the right spirit. O God, with this hour, third hour, so I pray that, follow. Cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. O God, with this hour, we do it three times, and then uh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and comfort me with thy guiding spirit. In, in some traditions, that's inserted actually into the anaphora. I don't do yes. that. I sure. do that for actually actually start the start the service, and then I finish up. I finish up with two collects. Uh, the uh, the prayer for uh, the prayer for purity, where they've written by Saint uh, Leo the Great, Almighty God, in whom hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. Okay, and there's a very short collect, Mentis Nostris Quasim Domine. Um, cleanse our heart and our minds, O Lord, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, um, who proceeds from who proceeds from Thee. It's interesting. It's a Latin prayer, but there's no filioque in there. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. I'm very fond of that prayer. Well, we're very fond of you, Father, and of your teaching, and we're very grateful for your sharing your own life and your own struggle to uh, pray through the Scriptures and to meet God in the scriptures. It's been a tremendous inspiration to, uh, to our parish to have you here it was reassuring. teaching. It's reassuring. I never really know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for the interview. I don't have to cultivate self-doubt. It's, it's already there. It's just there. It's a gift from God. <laughs> May he bless us. And I ask your prayers. Thank you so much. <laughs>